Father, we thank you for this beautiful day, Father. Beautiful day in the natural and beautiful day in the spiritual, Father, that we have been stirred up this morning, Lord. We thank you for your presence, Father. We thank you for your word. We thank you for your name that is above all names. Thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. How many of you in here use your phone as your alarm? All righty then. It might, might sound a little uh, loud and really rude whenever you uh, allow it to go off. Some of you have these little fun things. This is annoying if you hear it nonstop in the morning and you can't find your phone. The reason I bring that up is because today is a wake-up call. The name of this teaching is a wake-up call. There is a spirit world. Ooh. We go on about our day, day to day, doing our deeds, day in, day out, and we forget that there is a spirit world. And that is what we're going to be talking about today. One of the things I wanted to share, and I do want to give Scott an opportunity, um, uh, we chatted last night and it was just funny because uh, we said, wow, I'm so glad you shared that with me, Scott, because my teaching is about the spirit world and about, you know, interacting with demons and angels and things of that nature. And one of the things I'd like to do is, is have him come up and just share what happened to him um, the other day. Was it yesterday? Last night. Come on up, Scott. Give Scott a hand. We're going to let him share something that happened to him yesterday at work. You are, sir. How y'all doing? Great. Who remembers being a kid and having no worries, no problems, nothing, everything was just great? How many people miss that? Okay. Last night, working at Food Line, I had a... Uh, I was sweeping the floors, getting ready to run the scrubber around the floors and everything. Came around the corner, almost ran into a gentleman. He apologized to me. And uh, just to kind of give you an idea what this guy looked like, this older white gentleman, full white beard, looked like Santa Claus. <laughs> so I kind of looked at him and I said, hey, no problem. See you in December. <laughs> so he... Um, he just turned and looked at me and he just asked me, he says, have you been a good boy this year? And I was like, uh, yeah. <laughs> so he says, um, he told me, he says, you know, it's not nice to lie to Santa Claus. <laughs> and I said, no, I've been good. But at that moment, talking about the whole spirit thing, he made me feel like that little kid that had no worries, no problems. Um, and that day, I mean, my day was just, to say the least, just, from me all day um, and I'm trying to remember you know Pastor Bob always saying just give all your worries to God and let him take care of it and I've tried that and it's worked so much and then I just kind of like I think let it go but been praying and I think God put that guy in my path yesterday to get me back to that not worrying state and I'm glad that he did that for me. And that's it. Amen. So now when Scott was sharing this with me last night, I was, um, I was kind of chuckling to myself because there must be something about grocery stores, you know? I don't know what it is about grocery stores. But when he was telling me that, before he even said how he felt about this person, the Holy Spirit told me this was an angel that God had sent to him in the form of something he could relate to. And God allowed this angel literally to release him. Did you know in Hebrews it talks about how we entertain angels unaware? We'll go over that scripture here in a little bit. Something about grocery stores. I was about 18 years old, and I was tired, 18, 19, somewhere in there. I was really, really tired. I mean, it was like midnight. The only time I could actually go grocery shopping because I was working, I was going to school, Bible college, the whole nine yards all at one time. And I'm literally leaning on the shopping cart, pushing it in the back area of the grocery store. 
And I get to this hose, garden hose, that was laying in the middle of the floor going over to the refrigeration units. Apparently they were cleaning them or something. And I hit it, and I didn't even realize what I had hit. And I'm like, oh, I've got groceries in here. How am I going to lift this thing over? So I thought, oh, I'm going to go around and lift it up. And before I could go this way, this man just showed up out of nowhere, literally. Blonde hair, jean jacket, blue jeans kind of saw the side of his face. He walked around, lifted up my shopping cart, did like this, and walked right down the aisle. Well, I kept pushing, and I went, wow, thank you. He was gone. It was not a person. It was an angel. Now, how many times in our lives we go through, and we, we talk to people, we interact with them, and they leave, and we're like, wow, you know, something about that person. Well, maybe there was something about that person. Okay. Do you believe that the Bible is the Word of God? I mean, really, the Word of God. What's in this book is true. What's in this book is real. Every part of this book can be applied to our lives. Now, you may have King James Version. You may have NIV. You may have Amplified in every other version that's out there. I think there's like, oh my gosh, I can't even think how many, if anyone knows, shout it out hundreds, maybe even thousands of translations of this word. But the word is true, and it's up to us to study to show ourselves approved so that we know that what we're reading is balanced. Now, everything in it, you believe it, right? Really? Are you ready for this teaching? Mm. <laughs> when it's raining outside, sometimes you don't see the sun, right? It's up there above the clouds but you know it's there. When you breathe, you're breathing in air. You can't see it, but you know it's there. When we go about our daily lives, interacting with people, going places, there is a spirit world that you may not see, and yes, it is there. It is very real. We're going to look at Genesis 2, verse 1. We'll look at this in the King James Version. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them, in Genesis 2.1. When God created the heavens and the earth, he created the heavens and the earth, and the hosts. The hosts there, when you look into the original words, he's not just talking about Jupiter and Mars, folks. He's talking about more than just that. There are other beings that were created God creates humans as well as the angels and the cherubim and the seraphim. These are two, two uh, beings that are talked about in Scripture, is the cherubim and the seraphim. In Genesis 3, 24, it says, So he drove out the man, this is talking about Adam, and he placed at the east of the Garden of Eden cherubims and a flaming sword, which turned in every way to keep the tree of life. He was guarding that is what that cherubim did. There are seraphim mentioned in Scripture. In Isaiah 6, verse 1, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. Above it stood seraphims. Each one had six wings. With twain, which means two, he covered his face. With twain, two, he covered his feet. And with two, he did fly. And one cried to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. There are beings throughout scripture that are talked about that God himself created. Guess what? They're real. They are not a figment of your imagination. We find out that we are not a part of this world, that we have been chosen out of this world in John 15, 19. If we were of this world, it says, the world would love his own. But because you're not of this world, I have chosen you out of the world. Therefore, the world hates you. In Romans 12, 1, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Verse 2. And be not conformed to this world. 
but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is good and acceptable and perfect will of God. People say, well, I don't know the will of God. He's not talking to me. I don't know his voice. I don't know what to do. Well, do not be conformed to the image of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Well, how do we do that? By the word of God. Absolutely. A lot of this is elementary. Most of you already know this part of the teaching, but I wanted to review it and make sure that we're all on the same page as we get started here. As sure as there is a God, there is a devil. Surprise. There is a devil. As sure as there are angels, there are demons. As sure as there is a heaven, there is a hell. If you believe the word of God is true, then all of that is packed right in that book throughout the entire scripture. And for us to ignore that fact, and I will say this very lightly, especially those who are called to be an evangelist, especially those called in evangelism, to walk around and ignore the fact that people are dying and going to hell every single day, it's just, it's sad. And I'm bringing this word because I want to, number one, always encourage you to stir you up, to look around you, to be more aware of what's going on. It's not all about me. Everybody say that. It's not all about me. I don't have to feel good. I don't have to have what I want all the time. Oh, let's say that one. I don't have to have what I want all the time. Wow, that's news to some folks. I want what I want all the time, but I don't have to have what I want all the time. I mean, you think God's going to rapture a dirty church? I mean, really, there's some die into this flesh that's got to take place in some areas. I mean, we go through things and we expect it all to be wonderful all the time. When in reality, every one of those, those things are tests and trials to grow us up. God does not allow anything to happen to you that he doesn't know about. He may not be able to do those things to you, but he does allow them. And that's scriptural. Read the book of Job and see what happened to him. He allows things to happen. So don't get all bent out of shape at your brother or your sister or your cousin, sister, friend, worker, or whoever it is. Don't get bent out of shape over what they did to you. God has allowed these things to happen to show you something about yourself so that we can grow and learn and become that glorious bride that he's called us to be. Amen? It's time to deal with any areas of sin in our lives. We've been pushing it down, pushing it down. Somebody asks you to do something, you do the total opposite. You know, and roots of rebellion and fear and doubt and anger piling up. It's time to let those things be dealt with by God. Can I say, no matter what it takes. Now, if you get to the point where you hate that thing in your life, you will get to the point where you will say that no matter what it takes because you start realizing that relationships around you are failing. Things that are happening in your world are getting rocked. I'm not trying to say it's all your fault, but I am saying stop a minute and look at what God's doing. Is God, what God's allowing to happen, is it the enemy that's coming against you that you need to stand up to? Is he giving you an opportunity to fight a battle in the spirit realm? Doesn't mean that you're just a bad boy and you need to be disciplined. Well, let me just put this on him so he can get, you know, disciplined. But it is to train us to do the work of the ministry. Let's look at Romans 6.16. I asked Rick if we can look at this one in the Amplified. Do you not know that if you continually surrender yourselves to anyone to do his will, that you are slaves of him whom you obey? Whether that be to sin which leads to death or obedience which leads to righteousness, right doing and right standing with God, 
What is that? Whatever you submit to becomes your master. Whatever you're going to be obedient to, you're going to continue to be obedient to the sin in your life, the fleshly desires, the worldly things that people are drawing us into? Or are we going to be obedient to the word of God that we truly believe is the word of God? As Christians, it's time for us to stand up and say, you know what? The Bible says be sober and vigilant because your adversary prowls around looking whom he may devour. Well, guess what the word sober means, folks? Hey, I'll be the first one to tell you as a casual, you know, drink with friends as a Christian. Those of you know I have sat down, I'll have a glass of wine, but you know what? No more. Haven't in a long time. You know why? Because I'm going to be sober and vigilant to know what's going on around me. When we start feeling more comfortable out there in the bar than we do sitting in church, we know that the world has influenced us. Take a deep breath. Everyone, take a deep breath. <laughs> yeah. I don't want this to be a heavy word, but I want it to be a wake-up call. Remember the alarm? Okay. Yeah, some of y'all's alarms sound like that. There's something the Holy Spirit has been bringing to my spirit over and over and over again, and I will give you this as a thus saith the Lord. This is in John 10, verse 1. This is so important, so, so important. My sheep know my voice. My sheep know my voice. Just as an infant, a baby, has to learn to hear its father's voice, its mother's voice, and it grows up knowing its parent's voice. Just as that, we grow up learning God's voice. When you first come into the kingdom of God, you may not know the devil's voice from your voice, from God's voice, or anybody else's voice. But as you grow in the Lord, some of us who've been Christians for 20, 30, 40 years, we better be knowing the voice of God. It says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that entereth not by the door into the sheepfold, but climbeth up some other way, the same as a thief and a robber. But ye, he that endureth, I'm sorry, but he that entereth in by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the porter openeth, and the sheep hear his voice, and calleth, he calleth the sheep, own sheep by name, and leadeth them out. And when he putteth forth his own sheep, he goes before them. And the sheep follow them, follow him, because they know his voice. They follow him because they know his voice. And a stranger they will not follow, but will flee from him, for they know not the voice of strangers. When we spend time in the, in the Spirit, we spend time worshiping Him. We spend time reading His Word. We spend time praying. We spend time with other believers and Christians. We, we bring ourselves into the presence of God where two or more are gathered in my name. I am there in the midst of them. It's not just during prayer time, folks. When we gather together, did you know, even though you can't see Him with your eyes, He's here right now? Why? Because I believe that word of God is true. I believe it. How many of you believe it? I would like to introduce you to someone today. Someone who hates you more than you know. He wants you dead. He's like a murderer. Like a serial killer. Serial killers have specific people they're looking for. They're looking for Christians. Ah, you have a serial killer after you in the spirit realm. Did you know that? That's pretty serious when you stop and think about it. Make sure you want to look over your shoulder a little bit more, you know. But it's true. He's like a serial killer. Look in 2 Corinthians 4, verse 3. But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of him which believeth not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. He is the God of this world. Right now, and you thought you were living in your own little world, 
you are living in his domain. And we wonder why Ephesians said to put on your whole armor because he's looking for you. Oh, well, some of us have got one of, you know, got my helmet of salvation, but man, I don't have that shield of faith up because I don't know if I believe the word or not. I'm only going to believe this much, right? We don't have the truth girded around us any more than we have the peace of God on our feet where we walk. We walk into a place and everyone gets tense. They're here. We don't have any peace. And I'm saying as a general rule, we should have the peace of God. Where we go, people should feel comfortable in our presence. When you go to Pastor Bob and Susan's house, oh, give me the chair, give me the sofa. You feel peace. You feel comfortable because an atmosphere has been provided for people to feel that because they're in the presence of God in their own home. Now, I'm skipping around a little bit. I'm probably going to take these papers and set them down soon. But we are in a constant battle. Surprise. We are in a constant battle. Satan cannot be two places at once. I have seen people pray for people. It's not a problem. It's all in learning. I cast thee out, Satan, in Jesus' name. Well, guess what? <laughs> guess what? Satan probably isn't in him. And that demon that's in him is not going to leave because he's they're legalistic, and they're not going to listen to what you just said. And we wonder why people don't get delivered. Because you're trying to cast Satan out of the person. Do what Jesus did. I come against you, you unclean spirit. Get out of him in Jesus' name. The name of Jesus. You know, Edie did that teaching on our uh, thing that she had emailed to us on the name of Jesus. I need to print that off and hand it out to everybody as long as I have your permission as I'm asking you in front of the entire congregation. Okay. <laughs> I figured you'd say yes. Okay. He can't be two places at one time, folks. And guess what? The devil can't make you do it. You have a free will. Even the Gadarean met Jesus when he came off the boat, and he had a legion of demons. You know how many a legion is? Five to six thousand. That man was messed up. He was hurting for sure, cutting on himself and everything else. The devil's not in hell right now, guys. The Bible says that he's roaming the earth, seeking whom he may devour. I'm sorry, Rick, I'm skipping all over the place. Let's... Um, Let's go, Rick, to Ezekiel. Ezekiel 28, verse 13. There's something about Satan I want all of us to be aware of, something that we were taught, um, some of us who uh, went to a different church with some training and all on very detailed information in the Word. And this is one of the things that was brought up in Ezekiel 28, 13. Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. Well, Satan was in the garden of God. Every precious stone was thy covering, the sardius, topaz, diamond, beryl, onyx, jasper, sapphire, emerald, the carbuncle, and gold. The workmanship of thy tabrets and of thy pipes was prepared in thee in the day that thou wast created. Satan, and we always said, well, you know, he was prideful and, you know, he came against God. Well, that's true, and God cast him out. But you know why he was prideful? He was all purdy. He had every, every single stone you can imagine was in him. Can you imagine the glory of God himself shining? I mean, us girls, we like to take our diamonds and shine them up in the light. What if you had all that on you, a part of your very being? Bling, bling, for real. Look at this last part. The tabrets of thy pipes was prepared in thee the day thou was created. He had musical instruments. He was the choir, folks. He was beautiful. Absolutely beautiful. And he thought of himself more highly than he should have. Oh, it's all about me. Right? No, it's not. <laughs> Rosemary. It's not all about us. The second that we get offended, what was that that I said before when we were having our little teaching up here? You owe me nothing. If you offend me and my heart is wounded, instead of me wanting to get back at you, 
that's not love. Well, he should have done this. And having all these expectations on how you should act, this is what you should do. Instead of that, that's not love. Love's not rude and boastful and expecting all this stuff. You owe me nothing. You owe me no apology. You owe me nothing. Love. What does the scripture say? Oh, no, man, nothing but love. Because the way you judge that person is the way you're going to get judged. I want to be judged by love. Amen? How many of y'all want to be judged by some love up in here? Some of y'all been in some, some dirty places. Amen? All right. Now you know. I've just introduced you to someone who was at the throne of God, as beautiful as he was. Now in... Um, 1 Peter 5, we're going to start in verse 6. We're saying, hey, surprise, you have an enemy. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time. First and foremost, casting all your care upon him, for he cares for you. Be sober, be vigilant. Because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about, seeking whom he may devour. Now we'll stop right there. Satan will do whatever he can to make you fail. He's real, folks. He's not alone. Remember I said he can only be one, one place at one time. He's not omnipotent and omniscient like God, who can be everywhere. He is one place at one time. He will do whatever he can to make you fail. Fail in your marriage. Fail in your job. Fail with your children. Fail with anything that's in your life. Your work in the ministry. We get comfortable walking in. Presence of God. We worship. We hear the word of God. We know one o'clock comes and we're like, all right, time to go eat. We go eat. We crash. Drool coming out of our mouths as we're taking our naps because we're so tired because we stayed up until 2 o'clock the morning before. Then we get up, and what do we do? We eat all over again. And then we go to sleep and go to work Monday, right? I mean, we have a routine. We have a routine, a schedule. But what if, are you ready for this one? What if you're called to teach? Don't make me call you out because I know who you are already. I've been praying for some teachers up in this place. There's going to come a time where you're going to walk up in that door, and you're going to walk down this aisle, you're going to have your seat, and you're going to get shifty. And I want you to remember this message. I told you so. There's going to come a time where God's going to expect you to use the gift that's on the inside of you to come up here and share one verse you read last night to just burn it in your heart. And if one verse, you don't have to be a teacher up here teaching two and three hours to get a point across. A teacher lives a lifestyle of a teacher. If it's one verse, one experience, one word of encouragement, you have just changed a person's life. And I am praying for you because I know I've been there. God had told me I saw a vision of a pencil. I was... I always wanted to be a teacher when I was a little girl, but as I was growing up, I guess I was about, I keep going back to 18, such a good time in my life, I guess, but he showed me this vision of a pencil. All I could do was wail, ah! Okay, yeah, cry over a pencil, right? And I'm like, God, please don't sharpen me like a pencil. I don't want to be used like a pencil. Ah! I mean, I broke down because God was showing me Something I had no idea was going to happen. That I would be up here. I'm praying for you. Because your day is going to come. And you're going to walk up here. And you're going to have the boldness of the Lord. Because you know without a shadow of a doubt that God has put it on the inside of you. You may never have walked up here and spoken before. But the day is coming. The day is coming. Amen. They always said I was like Jeremiah, cry over everything. The truth will set you free. Look at John 8, 31 through 32. Satan's power is based by, I'm sorry, is 
Satan's power is strengthened by and based on human belief in lies. I'm going to say that again. Satan's power is strengthened by and based on human belief in lies. Well, if it ain't there, I don't have to think about it. It's not in my face. Well, guess what? Their spirit world is real, whether you want to believe it or not. It is real. It is there. It is functioning very well in Charleston, my folks. I have a lot of things to share with you on that today. Jesus, therefore, said to his those Jews who had believed him, if you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. I think it was Charles Stanley's devotional that I have. I've got one from Chuck Swindoll, one from Charles Stanley that I read. In one of those, it had a statement about how people who stay in the word of God have less error in their life, less error as far as understanding the word of God, and people who don't read it at all, they just go by whatever someone else says. So when it's all said and done, and we stand before our Lord, are we going to be able to say, I know you? We may know things about him based on what someone else has preached, but do we know him in an intimate relationship? Have we opened the word and allowed him to speak to our hearts and our lives? There is a Satan. He has an end. We know he's going to be bound up and thrown into the pit, hopefully soon. There is a hell. In Matthew 25, verse 41 is where we're going to go. 25, verse 41. Then he will also say to them on the left hand, Depart from me, or go away from me, you cursed ones, into the everlasting fire, having been prepared for who? The devil and his angels. It wasn't prepared for us originally, for those for people who aren't saved. It was not originally prepared for, us, for those people. It's prepared for the devil and his angels. Hell was mentioned in the Bible in so many different ways. It's Sheol, Hades, Tartarus, Abyss, Gehenna, all these different words. And as I was studying those different words, I realized, and I, and I watched one of Perry Stone's videos and kind of gleaned some information from that too about the underground world. There are different chambers set up in hell. You have the bottomless pit. You have the abyss. You have, I mean, there's all these different, we're talking five different chambers that are actually mentioned in scripture. There's a whole other teaching. It would take two hours to teach you all over that with you with you later if you want or maybe we can check it out maybe pastor bob would allow us to do that um one of the scriptures i'll tell you about is in revelations 9 verse 13 having to do with the end times and the sixth angel sounded his trumpet and i heard a voice from the four horns of the golden altar before god saying to the sixth angel who had the trumpet loose the four angels who are bound at the great river Euphrates. Right now, and, and these are not good angels, they slay a third of the men back, you know, in the end here. There are four angels right now bound in the river Euphrates. You can believe the word of God or you cannot believe the word of God. It's right there. They're going to be loosened. And there are others that are bound right now that God is not yet loosed. Because if he did, we'd be in real trouble. There's archangels. Gabriel. Gabriel is the one of revelation. He was created to come and bring revelation. He's the one who came to Daniel and said, Hello, I'm going to tell you about your dream or your vision. He's the one who came to Mary and said, Guess what? You're going to have a baby. He's the revelation archangel. You've got Michael. He's the one of warfare. There are scriptures in here I can go over with you later if you need to, to have those. I'll be happy to give them to you later. Ask me for a copy of my teaching. I'll give you all 20-some-odd pages of it. Michael is considered one of the chief priests in Daniel 10, 13. He is one, and I would like to look at this one, Daniel 12, 1. Sorry, I'm going so fast, Rick. We're on page 11. Daniel 12, 1. And at that time shall Michael stand up, the great prince which standeth for the children of thy people. I want to stop right there. 
Did you know that you have an archangel on your side that stands up for you? Right there. There's nothing wrong with you saying, yo, Michael, I need you. God, please send Michael. Jesus, thank you for Michael. Thank you for all those that he has under him. Because even in the book of Daniel, it talks about a, uh, an angel that came to Daniel to reveal a vision to him and said, hey, if it wasn't for Michael, I would have never made it to give you this answer. He stood in the gap. He helped me to bring this answer. There is a spirit world, folks, and it is functional. Are you wearing your armor? Did you know angels, I mean, uh, animals can see things in the spirit realm? How many of you in here have heard the Balaam story? Balaam, the donkey? Yeah. Balaam thinks he's all great, fine, and wonderful. He's just riding along with his donkey on the way going somewhere, and God was a little upset with him about what he was doing. And the donkey saw the angel standing there with a sword getting ready to kill Balaam. And that donkey moved over, and he's like, I'm not going anywhere. Crushed Balaam's foot up against the rock. He was squawking. What are you doing? He beat his donkey. Kept going. And it keeps saying over and over again in Scripture, and the donkey stopped, and he got beat, and the donkey stopped, and he got beat over and over again, and finally, God opened the donkey's mouth, and he's like, what are you doing to me? I'm trying to keep you from dying, and you know what's amazing about that is Balaam didn't freak out and fall on the ground and go like, oh my gosh, my donkey's talking to me, but he talked back to him. He's like, I keep telling you to go do it. Da, 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 da. They got in this little discussion over it. And then the angel of the Lord opened Balaam's eyes and he saw that angel with that sword and he fell. Lord, have mercy. Now, I had an experience years ago. <sighs> Pardon? Yeah, after beating him, he had to fall. Yeah, mm-hmm. I was in, this is when I lived in Somerville, I was at, um, in my trailer, and this is shortly after the Holy Spirit had revealed to me my calling and everything else. And I had... Um, it was Satan, guys. This was not just a little demon coming in to harass me. I was laying on my sofa, and he came in, and he hovered over me, and he put his hands near my eyes. He wanted to pluck my eyes out. That's symbolic of vision, being able to see things. He was trying to take away that which God had given to me. And I tell you, I have never in my life, up until last year, had that strong of a presence around me, ever. When it left, my dog, Cindy, precious little Cindy, you remember Cindy? Was on my chest, protecting me, laying there, watching me to make sure I was okay. And I knew she was there to protect. Satan didn't come in her and try to attack, no. This dog was very sensitive to the Holy Spirit and other spirits in our home. When that occurred, I knew, I knew that I knew that I needed to be aware of the spirit world. And that's when I started doing some more studying and understanding of it. Years later, I said, not until last year, years later, I was um, with Floyd. He was doing some work down at the old Baker Hospital down there on Azalea in North Charleston. And just went over there to, you know, go visit him, give him something. I don't even remember why I was there that day. I walk in, and he's trying to give me a tour of the place. And I come to this door, and some of you have already heard this story. I came to this door, and it, like, took my breath away. I mean, there is something bad in that room. It is bad in that room. We come to another door, and I walk in, and I, I, it's just not... You know, I'm standing in the foyer area, which I didn't realize it at the time. I go in a little bit farther, and this is right across from the room that has a really bad one. I go over here into this room, and I'm just standing there, and it's kind of dark in there. You know, you've got the big poles, the walls are all out and everything, and I just feel this overwhelming death, like a spirit of death in this room. And Floyd said, turn around. And when I turned around, I could see the beams. If any of you have been in construction, you know when they frame up doors, they have to use really heavy beams in a hospital especially when you have those big heavy doors so it goes up like this and I'm like where am I standing what is this place I just walked into it was the operating room emergency operating room 
And I could tell Floyd, I said, and this is what I told him, I said, I know it's over here. He has boundaries. He can only go so far. He said, that's where the wall used to be. The wall is no longer there. They built office space on the other side after the fact. He was bound to that one area. He was mad. He's probably been sitting up in there not doing anything for a long time, just watching. And you could feel the heaviness. And it's like I just knew. The one across the hall, I didn't even dare go in that room by myself. That was not funny. I called Bob Shaw because he's real sensitive to the Holy Spirit and things like that. He, he really, you know, I said, you got to come to this place. I'm not telling you anything. I want you to walk in here and tell me what you feel. He walks in, and he goes down the hallway and stops. Not the same entrance I was at, but he's at an entrance on the other side, and he looks. I mean, he literally stopped in his tracks and looked. He said, there's something deep inside. So, see, he was looking at the office space side, and he could tell there was something deep inside. We walked through. We all learned something that day. You're going to bind it and send it to a dry place? Guess what? It's already in a dry place. There's times to take authority over something, and there's times to leave it alone. Remember that. There are some people that we might lay hands on to pray for them for deliverance when we really shouldn't be praying for it at that time because you know what the scripture says in Mark. You can cast that demon out, but if that house doesn't get all cleaned up and squared away, that demon's going to come back with seven more stronger than it, and that person's condition is going to be worse than it would have been if you just left them alone, okay? Now, Bob Shaw, we walked through that other side. That one was a murderous spirit like I have never sensed in my entire life. I mean, we tagged it, boom. There were certain areas that we just couldn't even walk. Now, I'm telling you this to make you aware of something that I'm getting ready to say. When you go into a home, you go into a building, you go into any place, another person's house. There is a specific atmosphere that is in that home. A lot of times you might walk in and be like, you know, I really don't feel comfortable here. Something's not right. It feels worldly. Or it feels like there's anger in this home. It just doesn't feel right. There's a spirit there, folks. That discernment that you have is there for a reason. Bind that thing. Call it by what it's making you feel like. I feel angry right now. Bind it. You know, Joseph Prince, I heard him say, he would pray for people, couples, everybody would be happy, nice, forgiven, life is great. And the second they pulled up in the driveway at their house, he said he had them in a great atmosphere, the presence of God, everything was wonderful. And then they went right back into the home where the anger and fear and doubt and, and all this stuff was going on in the home. When we move into a house, we should be praying over that home, making sure it's clean. And it is our responsibility not only to keep this house clean, but to keep our homes clean of spiritual nonsense. And, and fathers, I always said, you know, Lord, I feel for you guys. Fathers, husbands, it's your responsibility as the head of the home to make sure that stuff doesn't stay there, to get it out. Be sensitive to your wife if she comes to you and says, you know, something's just not right here. Just agree in prayer. Walk around the house. Get your bottle of oil. Put cross marks. Pray over it. Whatever you got to do. But anoint the house and separate it for God's glory. When you go home today, I challenge you, if you've got people in and out of your house like we do constantly, pray through your house before they show up and after they leave. Have some good, solid Christian music going on most of the time. It will make a huge difference in the atmosphere that's created in your home. And the enemy will come and look in the door and be like, hmm, I don't want to go in there. I hear too many Jesus words. You know, seriously, they will leave. What happened with... Um, now, I, I could have taken this experience with Baker Hospital and been like, wow, this is awesome. Let's bring a seance crew in here. Let's just figure this out. Wow, let's talk to it. Let's interact with it. I want to know stuff. What? 
Let's go to Deuteronomy 18. Hey, some of y'all up in here are laughing. Guess what? There's people sit at home watching Ghost Lab, Haunted, Ghost Hunter. Come on, y'all know the names. Guess what? What we're getting ready to read right here, I hope you don't watch them anymore. When thou art come into the land, this is, yeah. Oh, yes, thank you. Leave that one right there. We're going to work our way to that scripture. Just leave that one right there, Rick. For when they come into a land which the Lord God has given thee, thou shalt not learn to do after the abomination of these nations. That there shall not be found among you anyone that makes his son or daughter pass through the fire, that uses divination, an observer of times. Well, the moon's right there, and my horoscope said that I'm supposed to fall in love today. What? Really? How are they going to tell you that on a piece of paper? For real? Never mind. Don't get me going. Or an enchanter, or a witch, or a charmer, or a consulter with familiar spirits, or a wizard or necromancer. A necromancer is someone who summons up the dead. They think it's the dead person, and it's really a familiar spirit just telling them what they know. Well, you're going to read my palm. You can tell me something about myself, right? What? God created my palm? These people are talking to familiar spirits, folks. They're not looking at the lines on your hands. They're not. The word of God is true. It's an abomination to the Lord thy God. It's an abomination. I'm sorry, but that's a strong word. As Christians, as godly leaders, responsible Christians, we are not to be looking like and acting like the world. Really? Well, I think if I do this, it's going to make them want to know God more. Well, this is what I want to do. What? Do the word of God and it will draw all men unto him. Lift up Jesus. When I am lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. You don't need to be acting like the world and going and doing all these crazy things to your body and everything else. Obey the word of God. There's certain things that are an abomination. They're rooted in witchcraft. They're ungodly. Ungodly. It's the way it is, folks. I got teachings coming out my ears at home on this stuff. All right. Abomination. Keep going. So, we have this experience at Baker Hospital. Did I have a seance? No. We prayed. There was a man that worked there who had been there. He was a caregiver, caretaker of the property to make sure things were taken care of. Obviously, that's what a caretaker does. And, you know, we were all talking about it. I was very open. I said, there's something here. This is what it is. This is what it's doing. Bob Shaw came in. Same thing. This is what it is. The people that were working there with Floyd started going to Floyd. My hair is standing up on the back of my neck. It's really cold over there. They're having manifestations of things. And what I noticed is those who were Christians that went into that building, every one of them picked it up in their spirit. They didn't have physical manifestations. Those whose salvation I really wasn't sure about, their hair was standing up. They'd feel this cool breeze. One felt physical, outward manifestations is what they were aware of because they're not awakened spiritually yet. They, they didn't have the discernment in the inside to know. There are, on these paranormal, okay, paranormal activity threes coming out, it's a movie. They've got, it's like one, two, three. It's Halloween. You know, all these people are going all crazy about ghosts and goblins and all this stuff. So paranormal, it's something I just read on MSN or something. It's coming out on October 21st. Not that you're going to run out and go watch it or anything, right? The reason I bring that up, on these shows, they, they have a sound monitor where they can hear any sound outside of our normal hearing range. They have EMF or electromagnetic force monitors that shows you different force fields in the home. They'll have 
pictures, videos, and all this stuff, and they put them all together and say, ooh, when this person felt that cold chill, the you know, electromagnetic force went way up here, and oh, it's got to be a spirit. Oh, I have a picture. There's a shadow over there. And they, they go chasing after these things. And they're real. They're there. There's haunted houses where people get books and stuff thrown at them all the time. Those are very violent demons, and they will come at you if you're not careful. And I'm, trying not, I'm not trying to freak everybody out. The reality is you have an enemy that's against you. Willie, you say, I'm concerned, but I ain't worried. You can be concerned about your family and about your home, but don't get all worried and freaked out about it. Another thing that Charles said, I did get a chance to listen to your message. Curiosity. He said, if, you know, if there was a greatest sin, it would be curiosity. Ooh, I wonder, is it real? We get drawn into things that are ungodly because of our curiosity. So, and what do they say about a cat? Curiosity kills the cat? Mm-hmm. People are so eager to communicate. They want to communicate. I mean, God created us to communicate with him, to have a relationship with him. And I think that that desire in the inside of us to find something that we can communicate with that'll make us feel like we're okay, you know? Here's the freaky part. Are you ready for this part? We're at home. Comfortable, presence of God, everything's wonderful. I'm standing in the restroom and there's a shadow in my hallway watching me. I noticed it was watching me. And I turned around and looked, and it was there. And I said, I don't know who you are, and I don't really care, but you need to leave. Get out in Jesus' name. Bam, gone. Turned around, kept doing what I was doing. That week, Jonathan comes into the room. He had gone to bed. He got up. He was a little disturbed, and he's like, Mom, can't go to sleep. And I said, what's wrong? I'm having these bad thoughts these bad things in my mind. I don't know what it is. And I said, like what? Tell me. And then he says this. When I touch the light switch, I see skull and crossbones. I think about my fish that had died. I think about this, all dealing with death. We prayed, laid hands on the light switch. I prayed, you know, get rid of this thing. He was fine. A week later, gets out of bed. I'm having bad thoughts again, skull and crossbones stuff again. Floyd marched him in there that time and said, it's your turn. You need to take authority over it. That's your room. So they stand there. They put their hand on the light switch. There's a point to this. Prayed over it, told it to leave. Guess what? It's not there anymore. It's gone. It's his room. You got children, you got other people staying in your house, they need to walk through with you. Because you can have your whole house clean and have one room that's not clean. That can be creeping. I call them creepers. Anyway. Guess what I found out? The light switch came from Baker Hospital. I fixed the light switch. Yes. <laughs> A child who has the greatest discernment that I know, picked it up. If a child can pick that up, how much greater someone who's been in the kingdom for a while should be able to discern these things? Amen? It's very serious. I'm proud of him. He did what was necessary. And now, if he ever has any thoughts, he just knows how to bind up the enemy, and he does his warfare and goes, he's out cold. He knows what to do. Now, we're driving down the road, going to a friend's house on Sunday to go have dinner, riding down the road, and I'm messing with my phone. Floyd's driving, messing with my phone. And all of a sudden, something hits my spirit, and I look up. Guess what I'm looking at? The Baker Hospital property. That thing was watching, was watching us as we went by. I'm going to tell you something. As it turns out, back in the 1700s, there was a little inn, lodge of sorts in that area. 
who had a woman who was taking care of the people that would come into town and leave. Well, guess what? Some people were never heard of again after they stayed there. She had a bed in one of these rooms that would drop people into a dungeon that could not be heard. She was one of our first known serial killers in our country. On that same location, in that same area, these things are real, folks. They are there. They are there for a purpose, and it's up to us to take authority over them. It is, it's up to us in our own spiritual life not to allow things like that to enter in. It's up to us to make sure our family is protected. And all it is is the name of Jesus. Did you know you, the authority that you have on the inside of you is greater, greater when you're walking a righteous life? If I'm out there doing whatever I want, oh, I'm a Christian, and I'm doing whatever I want, I don't have the authority. I could say Jesus' name all day long. Who's going to jump out and get attack, attack me because I'm not doing what I'm supposed to? We've had deliverance sessions where the demons will speak out and say, oh, well, you're doing this. We'd have to stop the deliverance session, go pray and get our lives straight, and then come back in and pray for the person. Demons are real, and they speak out, and they will harass you if you let them. All right, there's all kinds of stuff I could go over, but one last thing here. 1 John 4.1. 1 John 4, 1. One way that we can tell about a spirit, when we feel a presence in the room or we feel something going on. So my dear friends, do not believe all who claim to have the spirit, but test them to find out if the spirit they have comes from God. I'm going to drop down to verse 6. But we belong to God. Whoever knows God listens to us. Whoever does not belong to God does not listen to us. This then is how we can tell the difference between the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. If people are following the word of God and they're listening to godly teaching, they're listening to the word of God, and you're seeing that change in their life, then hey, they're probably right on in their relationship with the Lord. But if they're not, and they're just doing the same thing over and over again and having the same problems, the same stuff, nine chances out of ten, there's some areas going on in there. And you can test the spirit that way. That's not just with, we, we, we think of deliverance and spirits as, oh, we're just looking at demons or angels. We have human spirits. We're created in the image of God. I can discern my husband's spirit, Melanie's spirit, all of y'all, gentle spirit, strong spirit there's there's you can discern the spirits of people just be aware it's a wake-up call be aware you live in a spiritual world and it's not your world it's satan's world but you're not a part of it get your armor on folks it's not going to get any easier Sorry to discourage you. <laughs> it's actually encouraging because you're going to see manifestations of God's power in a way you never have. When you lay hands on the sick, they are going to recover. You're going to see miracles, 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 and they are going to start happening very soon. I just feel that in my spirit. Amen.